Good morning. Great to see the sun shining out there for a change. Yeah. I think we just went from winter to summer. <laughs> um, Pastor Bill asked me if I'd like to like to speak. I said absolutely without hesitation, without thinking about it. But um, anyway, he asked me to pray about what to talk about. Um, there's a lot of things on my heart that I would like to talk about. But last time I was up here, I talked about my 14-year-long struggle with ulcerative colitis, which came to an abrupt end where I ended up in the hospital a few months after. So today I'm going to kind of fill in the blanks from then until now, which was maybe about a year ago. Or no. Yeah, anyways. <laughs> so... Um, August 27th, 2018, um, I went to the hospital, into the emergency, with what I thought was a gallbladder attack. Um, it was actually kind of funny because, like I talked about last time, I was a year in remission with no medication, no nothing, feeling great, and then all of a sudden, just out of the blue, um, just kind of just like that, got sick. So we went in there. Um, did a bunch of tests and everything, and they sent me home. They said I had uh, a partial blockage, which would probably pass in a few days. So just, you know, drink fluids and all that stuff. So I was like, great, back to work. Um, that weekend before that, my wife and I were in Toronto, and we made it down to Niagara Falls, where I have a cousin there. So that Sunday morning, we went to church with them, and it was funny because the, um, the pastor was talking about storms in your life, you know, spiritual battles that you have, and still there. <laughs> um, if you're not in a storm, you're coming out of one or you're going into one. There's just a constant... Um, you know, supernatural battle that we go through at all times, whether we realize it or not sometimes. Obviously, sometimes it's worse than others. Um, but anyway, this pastor talked about, you know, at times we just, you know, cry out to God and ask Him to, you know, take us from this storm and, you know, just swoop in and, you know, do miraculous things, which, which happens. But there's also times and seasons where you just have to ride it out. So... I didn't cry when I talked to myself in my living room. <laughs> Anyways, I thought about the story with Jesus in the boat with the fishermen in the storm, and they were basically freaking out, and Jesus was just snoozing, you know, he was chill. So through this whole process, I just pictured myself in the boat, chilling with Jesus, just riding the storm, and that... That helped me through a big time. So, um, they sent me home from the ER. Um, that was Monday. Tuesday was very bad, way worse. Um, Wednesday, it got to the point where the pain was almost unbearable. I went in with, I thought, gallbladder, so, you know, mid-abdomen, in your back, pain. By Wednesday night, Thursday morning, my whole body was just screaming that something was obviously wrong. So back in Thursday, we went to the hospital where um, they admitted me this time for stomach pains, they said. Um, it was actually a really frustrating experience. Um, it just seemed like they didn't take me seriously. I was in Charlottetown for two weeks in the hospital there where they did, they did tests, but they just kind of shrugged me off. They just kept giving me meds to handle the pain, which did sometimes, sometimes it didn't. Um, at that point, I probably wasn't eating at all. I was on like a Jell-O and broth diet, which was, don't mention Jell-O ever again to me. <laughs> but. Um, so they put a PICC line in, which probably some of you know, but it's like a catheter to your heart to give you like nutrients and stuff because I was losing probably two or three pounds a day. I was, after two weeks, I was down 30 pounds. Um, so um, at that point, um, 
my family doctor kind of stepped in, basically said, we don't know what's happening. It's beyond me. So they shipped me to Summerside where the internal specialist is. And basically, like, if I was in that hospital, she could care for me and, and, um, and that type of thing. So went to Summerside where she did a scope. Um, and the colitis or the disease had completely overtaken my colon to the point where it stopped working, basically. So in 2006, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. And from that point on, every yearly checkup, every family doctor visit, every time there was a flare-up, I was reminded constantly that I'm at a high risk for colon cancer. So, you know, probably hundreds of times since then, that's been brought up, you know. So although I was positive throughout the years, that's always right here in the back of your mind. So when something like this comes up and happens, that's kind of like the first thing that goes through your head. You know, it's just, you think the worst, right? So for a very brief time, I went through the what ifs, what if this, what if that, what about my family and my job and all those things. But I say briefly because I stopped myself. I said no matter, no matter what happens to me or my family from this point on, God is bigger than this. I don't know about you guys, but I trust him. We serve a good God. It says in Jeremiah that he gives us a future and a hope. But right before that, he says he has plans for good and not disaster. So if any remember the last time I was up here, I talked about the revelation that God gave me through Jeremiah 29:11 about the future and hope that he has for us. Um, this time around, in this season that I was going through, in this storm, if you will, that word disaster just popped out at me because it just seemed like I was in a natural disaster or unnatural disaster, whatever you want to call it. And honestly, it amazed me that that same scripture that God used to speak to me he was using again to speak in a different way in a different time in a different season um i was going to say the million times i've read jeremiah 29 11 and owen was like nope that would never happen if you only slept and ate and never stopped counting it would take you two months two days and two hours to count to a million so obviously i didn't read it a million times the seven times I read Jeremiah 29:11, it was different to me. <laughs> um, so, anyways, back to my story. Um, so, I'm in Summerside now. We're probably pushing like three weeks in the hospital, uh, down about 40 pounds now, which was super confusing because anytime someone walked in, they would just gasp with like tears in their eyes and they're like, oh, "You're so skinny," and I was like. Last 10 years I've been too fat and now in three weeks I'm too skinny. <laughs> it's a fine line. <laughs> uh, so anyways, um, this is interesting, this part. I'm going to read a scripture that may not seem relevant at first. Um, actually, Claude just read it, which is it's awesome. Malachi 3.10. This is the New King James Version. Bring all the tithes to the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that there, there will not be enough room to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. And obviously it goes on. So there was a devourer trying to destroy my life and my family and everything that I knew was normal. So, in the first part of that verse, it says, try me in this. That's a challenge. So, 
me and my wife, we tithe faithfully. So I don't know if my storehouse is full, but there's got to be something in there. So I said, okay, Lord, bring it. I'm going to try you in this. I'm helpless right now. I mean, we have four kids and one income, and I'm down and out. So I need you right now. So from that moment on, I will just say the floodgates opened. It was so overwhelming, the blessing that was poured into our lives. It literally came, literally by truckload. Um, everything, groceries and gift cards and money and people were throwing stuff at us. People we didn't even know were stopping at our house and, you know, actually the, the first van load of groceries came from a church that I've never been in in my life. So it was just amazing and overwhelming, the, the outreach of, of friends and family and strangers, I guess you could say. Um, my boss, he stopped by our house and he basically just said, you have no idea how many people are praying for you. He said, my church is praying for you. My brother's church in Ottawa is praying for you. My father's church in Windsor, Ontario is praying for you. My, my cousin in Niagara Falls, their church was praying for us. Our old church in Alberta, this church, you know, multiple churches in PEI. And I just thought, you know, we sing this song all the time that we raise a hallelujah. And I think that, in my mind, that's what that is, you know, when just the body comes together and just, you know, we lift it up, me and my family, and it was just, it was overwhelming. So, back to my story. Um, all this leads up to, um, the biopsies came back after the scope, and it wasn't cancer, praise the Lord. Um, but my colon was so damaged from disease that it had to be removed completely. There was really no other option on that at that point. So October 12th, and to put that in a little bit of context, so August 27th I went into the hospital and October 12th was the surgery. So there was a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. It was, it felt like 26 years to me. It's a lot of jello. <laughs> And day of surgery, I was 68 pounds lighter than I was on August 27th. So, a little scrawny. I can see I crossed that fine line there. Um, uh, the surgery was, I think it was about seven hours long, roughly. I obviously don't remember. My wife could fill you in on that part. Um, it went according to plan. at a great doctor. We had um, um, a laparoscopic guy came from the States, actually, just to do that, which was... Um, a blessing, I think. Um, recovery was rough. Um, you know, from 2006 on, I tried every medication going, you know, there's multiple different things we went through, and I always knew that surgery was kind of the last straw. So when it came to this point and they said, okay, you know, this is our only option, I was a little bit prepared for that, but I didn't think beyond just having a big surgery. So if anyone knows me, I just go, go, go. If I'm not working, I'm working kind of thing. So I, I mentioned to the nurse or one of the nurses that, you know, a couple weeks I'll be back at it, banging nails again. And she's like, well, you probably won't work until the spring if you can go back to your job at all. I'm a carpenter. I basically lift things for a living. Um, so I think mentally I wasn't, I just wasn't prepared for that. I don't know if I'd say I was in denial, but you know, I just figured surgery and I'm normal. Um, in ICU after surgery, they promoted um, moving around as much as possible to speed up the recovery process, which is, which is a great program they have there. But they would put this big belt on me with handles on it. So there would be a nurse on both sides, and they would hold me up, and I would walk. So day one was 10 steps was my goal, which I didn't reach. And then 15 and 20, it was, um, 
It was tough. I'd lost so much muscle with all the weight loss that I was so weak I couldn't even get dressed or even eat hardly. But I think mentally I was even, I was even weaker. You know, I wish that nurse was here today. Because although I didn't receive a supernatural healing in my body, you know, I had to go through surgery and everything, I truly believe I had a supernatural recovery. Four weeks after the day of surgery, I was back to work. One week after that, I was full time, 10 hours a day. Seven weeks after surgery, I laced up my skates for the first time in five years and played hockey, which I continued to finish the season, didn't miss a game. Was terrible, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> if anyone asks me today how I'm feeling, I tell them honestly that I don't ever remember feeling this good. So, I guess to wrap up, um, terrible things happen sometimes. You know, things that we can't comprehend or know when or why or how. But there's good in everything. And God is always there with you, no matter what you have to go through. So I thank him for the faith he gifted me with to ride the storm that I overcame. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. That's awesome, Ryan. Just absolutely awesome and very real. All right, Denise. Um, Denise said to me earlier, it's awfully hot in here. <laughs> so anyway, you know the Holy Spirit's all over her right now and for what she's going to, to, to give to us and bless us with. So go get them. And just kind of remember to hold your mic up somewhere around there. Okay? Okay. Good morning. I need my glasses on so I can see all my little notes. There's a song that uh, Big Daddy Weave has, and it's called My Story, and this is my story. In August 1999, my world changed. I was diagnosed with a disease called acromegaly. One in three million people are diagnosed with this disease. So in a nutshell, it's a tumor on your pituitary, which is located behind your optic nerves in the center of your head. Errol, my friend, came to visit me knowing I was going to have brain surgery and he witnessed to me about salvation of our Lord. I told him I'd think about it. <laughs> that same day, fear overtook me and I asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. David and Diane were my neighbors across the street and they invited me to come to church. The pastor was Billy Arsenault and we were meeting at Colonel Gray High School back then. Sometime after that, a man called Ron Cushmall came from South Africa, and his message was divine healing. I went up for prayer with the help of Diane holding me, and he stood in the gap believing for something that I could not yet believe. I did not honestly know what to think. When you are scared, you will do most anything. I had come out of the United Church, and I had never heard of the laying out of hands. I had got a prayer card for divine healing from him when he was here, and I said that prayer so much I memorized it. Lord God, I do attend to your words. I keep them in the midst of my heart, for they are life unto me and health to all my flesh. Every disease germ that touches my body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. I carried that prayer card everywhere I went. I started reading God's word. I had an old good news Bible. Never been opened much, but I opened it. Everything I was reading was exactly as Ron Cushmall was, had said and Billy Arsenal was saying. I got a call for my surgery two weeks later. Was I scared? You bet. Doctors don't tell you much good. They give you all the bad scenarios, it seems, stroke, brain damage, or death. When on the computer, that was awful. People put their horror stories on there. But I was so convinced that God's words were for me that I honestly believed that once I got there, 
my next MRI would show I would not even need surgery. After all, I gave my, Christ, my life to Christ. Matthew 8, 17 says he took up our infirmities and he carried our diseases. I believe that. 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. My MRI was done on the way to the surgery. I was having transnodal brain surgery. Years ago, they used to do craniotomies, and now they've pioneered a new surgery. So they went up in through my sinus cavity and cut into my brain so they could get to the, my tumor. I was so scared, and David was with me until they took me through the doors to go in for my surgery. Once inside that door, I'm laying on a little cot, and your mind is going wonky, believe me. I had a lovely nurse, or an angel as I choose to believe, who stayed with me. She talked to me, she distracted me from everything that was coming on once I went through those doors. I was in intensive care for four days, and then I went to another unit. It was kind of a blur. David never left my side. My mother stayed in PEI with our girls. They could not get all of the tumor. Too dangerous, could cause a stroke or kill me if they tried. They sent me home on meds that made me feel worse than the tumor ever did. They switched me to a new drug, which was given by needles, something new I had to learn. I was up to six needles a day, and it was still not working as they wanted it to. So I was switched to a long-acting drug, which was $36,000 a year. I work part-time. Major side effects was bowel cancer. Now I'm having more tests done. I'm in the Word every day. Joyce Meyer is my new best friend, and John Hagee, Creflo Dollar, and Billy Arsenault. I got so I was kind of preaching to everybody. <laughs> Do you know what God's Word says? Did I lose some friends? Probably. Were they really friends? Probably not. People know you one way. When you change, they do not like you anymore sometimes because they're uncomfortable around you. My family, David's family, sometimes the new me wasn't what they wanted. As you know, I like to talk. I was telling everybody about Jesus. I'm going to Halifax every three months for an MRI, blood work, and other tests. My blood could not be checked in Atlantic Canada. It went to the Princess Margaret Hospital in Ontario. One month to get my blood results back. We had no endocrinologist in PEI since the year 2000, so Halifax was my main doctor stay. Every time I went to the doctor, they tell you what they see and the results of your blood work. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we live by faith, not by sight, and I did. Honestly, I got to the point where I was blocking out what they were saying because they never told me what I wanted to hear. God says we are to take thought Take every thought captive and make it submissive and obedient to the word of God. I was listening to Christian music at home, my car, so my thoughts were always on him. What the doctors are saying did not line up with what God's word said. And they are, doctors are great. They know lots of things, but they have limitations. And my hope was in my Lord and Savior, Jesus, the great physician. On one trip over, I had myself and my husband so convinced that I was healed. And I believed it, and I believe he did as well. And the doctors were saying, same old, same old. And once we were home, David was upset, I was upset, and he said, where's your miracle now? And I said, crying, walking up the stairs, it's coming. In Romans 4.20, Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promises of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. In 2001, my blood levels are not stable. There's no more drugs. And the Halifax QE2 Cancer Treatment Center have a new doctor and a new machine they now can do stereotactic radiation, which is pinpoint accuracy so as they don't radiate your whole brain. My full family of believers, you, help me prepare for my journey to leave my family for five weeks to go to Halifax. This church family, and you are my family, 
prepared meals and delivered them for five weeks, five days a week to my family while I wasn't there to do it. Such a blessing. I had gone for a walk to clear my head and I ran into a neighbor who we sometimes babysat her cats. And I told her we weren't going to be available for the next five weeks because I was going to be going to Halifax. I did not know this woman other than having met her through babysitting her cats. She offered to come to our home every day, do homework with our girls, make them snacks, and stay with them till David got home. Blessings. Jacqueline had a paper route. I sometimes helped her. Her neighbor and son did the paper route for five weeks. Jacqueline got paid. Jacqueline got all the tips. Another blessing. And God shall supply all of our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So many other things happened. I can't tell you all because it was just overwhelming. But as a family, we were so blessed. The day I left to go to Halifax, I came to church that morning, and I went up for prayer. And Mike McGagan prayed for me. And I had so many things running through my head about what was going to happen, not so much about what was going to happen just with me, but with my whole family. And Mike said, it is so important that you pray over your medication that you're taking and pray over the authority that you have as a believer with Christ before you have your treatments. So every day I prayed, God allow this to do only as you enable it to do and no side effects shall touch my body in Jesus mighty name. Every day in that radiation machine, that is my prayer. I never once let anything else interfere with my thought process. I kept my thoughts on what I knew was his word. People came to visit me, took me to their church, introduced me to other believers. I was never without believers around me praying for me and knowing this was a huge help to stay focused. Please, if you tell someone you are praying for them, please do what you say you're going to do. When you're in a crisis and your life is turned upside down, you are counting on other people to keep you lifted up. Integrity is so important. Elizabeth Waugh connected me with New Covenant Ministries. David needed the car to be home with the girls for activities, and I was nervous about driving in Halifax. Car came home to PEI. Word came from New Covenant Ministries that I had a man from their church, Bob Rice, who was willing to pick me up and take me every day to and from my treatments. What an answer to prayer and what a blessing. And God shall supply all of our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Bob fed me the word of God every day while driving me, giving me guided tours of Halifax and Dartmouth. <laughs> he was incredible. Having someone remind you daily what the word says and agreeing with them in prayer, God is so good all the time. Bob asked me to be away for a few days. He was getting married. And he arranged for people to pick me up and take me back and forth while he was away. They took me out to lunch. They took me to their homes. Really unbelievable, except for a believer. Friends came from PEI, my girlfriend Nancy, Cliff and Vivian, and brought me back and forth so that I could come home, visit my family, because bringing them over there was a bit of an inconvenience for places to stay with three of them. The nurses kept saying how amazed they were at how well I was doing. Due to having had radiation, they prepare you for what was their norm. Hair loss on the areas they were radiating and being tired. Lydia, my youngest, was so concerned I was going to lose my hair. It's funny what children focus on. Anyway, I never lost a hair after five weeks. What a blessing. Most people have decreased energy, and this did not happen to me. Another blessing. I walked around with a little cassette player on. That's how old it is. <laughs> Most of the time with either a preacher or Christian music playing. Most days I walked in a park that was near where my brother lived. My father thought I was doing way too much. He'd call. I wasn't there. My brother told me I needed my own private line. I had so many phone calls. No cell phones back then. Not for me, anyway. 
My sister-in-law, where I was staying, had had radiation, and she couldn't believe how busy I was and the energy level that I had had. She had had uh, radiation treatments for one of her sicknesses, and so she had been through it. I took over my brother's household. They traveled a lot. I took over their laundry, their cooking, their cleaning, basically what I would be doing at home. I even tried to help their kids with their homework, except they were in French immersion, and that wasn't so good. Their mother had died the very same year I was diagnosed. She was 35 years old. At night, I slept with a CD player going. Heather and Alan Hale gave me Ron Quishmal CDs. Those were on constantly in my room. After five weeks of having the radiation, the only thing that happened was I got a cold sore on my lip. And the nurse said that that quite often happens from the stress that you have on your body. Every time thereafter, when I returned to Halifax for my checkup, I'd ask, when can I come off these meds? No was always the answer. Finally, the doctor agreed to let me try. They only know their ways. The blood tests, lots of tests were done on a regular basis to keep tabs on me. It is now 2019. I'm beginning my eighth year, no medication. Thank you, Lord. I, know, I now go to Halifax every three years, not every three months. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Yes, I still have MRIs, blood work, and other tests, but God has delivered me from this disease. My journey was not as I had planned. Note I said I, but God's timing is always perfect. Did I have doubts? Sometimes, yes, I did. Did I get discouraged? Yes, sometimes I did. Did I stop believing that God had the ability to do exactly as he said he would do? Never. God loves the person who perseveres. How many times is that said in the Bible? I believe that my journey was such a growing experience for me and that all the people, including our friends and family, who watched and listened to me say what I believe was part of God's plan. My father, who's now going to be 82 next week, said it really was a miracle. He kept asking me if I was telling him the truth. He thought I was hiding something from him because he couldn't believe that I was going through all of this and it was to my advantage. I believe I had to go through so that I would be stronger for him. Don't stop believing for your miracle. They really do happen every day. Let go and let God. Wasn't that fantastic? Yeah. It's nice to hear from a couple of faith champions. See people that actually went through the storm and come out the other side winning in life. And that's something we forget because we don't talk to each other as much as we should or tell our stories. And Revelations, it says, and they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. They overcome him, Satan. He's the killer. And John 10 says, 10 says, Jesus, Satan's come to kill, steal, and destroy. He's trying to do it every day in your life. If he can't get you, he'll get your kids. If he can't get your kids, he'll get your wife or your husband. Or if he can't get that, he'll get your finances. He's a killer. He's a terrorist. And he's working every day trying to destroy you. The only way we beat him is when we stick together. You heard her. Right? She said, the faith family helped and prayed. That's our job. That's what the army is. Some of us have the privilege of being in the military or in the police force. You get to work as a team. When you start off, you don't like the people you're with. When I was in service, boy, I was, I said, this is a weird group of guys I'm with. I really don't like this, right? I didn't like any of them. I didn't like the guy who was in charge because I thought I was tougher than him. And I didn't like the people I was with because they were from all over the United States. I just didn't care for them. And I spent most of my youth in PEI. So you imagine coming from PEI, being in the American military with a whole bunch of Yankees from down south. 
right? You had the northerners who didn't like the southerners and the blacks didn't like the whites and it was just, and I'm here from PEI going, wow, these guys are weird. It's the same thing. When, they, when you come as a team, you first start off, you don't, when I first become a Christian, I didn't like Christians. I didn't. You know, I come off the street, come out of an alley at the last of it, you know, and, and then I met Christians and you go, wow, I just don't like these guys. I just don't. And I'm saying to the Lord, I got saved in the woods. I get saved in the church. I don't encounter with God in the woods. I got like Paul, got slapped on the side of the head, but it was a log that did it. <clears throat> I didn't get knocked off a horse, I got knocked on my back. And I'm laying there and going, okay, if you're real, prove it to me. Well, five minutes later, he did do that. And I had this overwhelming experience with God that's never left me. The first four years of my life, I was like a big transformer. You ever walk up to a big electrical transformer, you can hear this hum coming off them? That's the way I was. And I thought all Christians got that. I did. I was just feeling like a million dollars, you know, a thousand volts going through me all the time. I thought that's the way everybody was until I started talking to them. And I realized very quickly uh, they weren't. I scared all the Baptists. They left. <laughs> then I went up to the Presbyterians and started talking to them. And they, they, they all left. The whole leadership left the room. They took off. And I said, listen, we're, I'm a Catholic, man. I said, you guys got Bibles. You should know what I'm talking about. But they didn't. They, they didn't have this encounter with God. And that's what we need. You need an encounter. But you don't need church. You don't need religion. You need an encounter with God. You need the living God inside you. So no matter what happens, what kind of hell comes against you, you know that Jesus is Lord. You know that in here. Not here, in here. When you have this encounter with God, it never leaves you. It never changes. Do you have doubts sometimes? Sure you do. Do you have failures sometimes? Yes. But you always stand up again and say, I know Jesus is Lord. And the more we stick together and the more we pray for one another, the stronger you are. Nobody can defeat you. Remember the prodigal son? He was in the pig pen, right? The rich one he took to took his father's wealth and he went and spent it on wild women and booze. I did the booze thing. And I was in a, I was in a pig pen, literally, and it's not a good place to be. But you don't know that when you're there. You don't. It says that he come to his senses. Boy, that's quite a revelation when that happens to you. You don't realize you're in a pig pen. You don't even realize you stink that bad. You think you're okay. You think you're 100 percent. Until something happens and you come to your senses, somebody speaks on your behalf. A grandmother praying for you, a neighbor, right? Somebody that you don't even know is sitting in traffic and you're walking down the street, they're praying for you. You don't even know that. That encounter, that supernatural encounter with God, that miracle that takes place changes your life and you come to your senses and you realize, oh, wow, I need to get to my father's house. There's more than enough there for me. And we need to long for our Father's house and ask our Father in heaven, Dad, things can be better than this, right? And we all have loved ones that are not, well, at least I do anyway, that are not heading to heaven right now. They have problems, alcoholic, drugs, you name it, stealing, fighting. That's my family anyway. You know, I, you probably might not have a family like that, but I do. Anyway, so you get to pray and intercede for them, and sometimes you go, wow, man, they haven't got the message yet, you know. But booze and drugs and, and sex does amazing things to you, screws you up, right? And it takes a long time sometimes for this stuff to come, but it will happen. Jesus didn't die on the cross for everybody to go to hell. He died on the cross for everybody to go to heaven. Every one of us. Every, technically, everybody in the world is saved. They just have to come to the realization, that come to their senses, and realize that Jesus is Lord. It says, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what it says. It's simple. Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's what we need to do. Sometimes we put religious tags on people and it wears them down. They go, I ain't doing that. But it's so simple to reach out and have Christ touch you and change you. And to believe the unbelievable, believe for miracles, believe for healing, believe for finances, believe that your kids will never go, I tell my kids, you don't ever want to go down the road I went down. If you want to know something about the dark side, 
You need to ask me. I can fill you in in detail. I've been there. Don't go down there, because you're not going to like it. And it's hard to get out of there. It is. You know. For about three years, I had them little, little marks on my wrist. They're called handcuffs. And when the police get to know you for a while, they'll grab a hold of them, they go behind your back, and they click about three extra notches. <laughs> That'll lighten up your life. Yeah. <clears throat> Especially if you're a wise guy like me. You don't need to get down that road. You don't need to have them experiences. It's good to have it as a testimony, but that's all you want. Testimony is a fa fantastic thing. You all have a story with inside you. Every one of you have a different story than me or the two stories that we hear today. And yours is special. And our Father in Heaven knows that. That's why he's called our Father. I have seven children and 24 grandchildren. And there ain't none of them the same. One's in the back there. Daughter's holding her up. None of them are the same. They're all different. So our father has to deal with us differently. Like he deals differently when he does with Gordy. Right? Gordy hears better than I do. Right? Sometimes the father's speaking to us when we're not here. We ask for ears to hear and eyes to see. So, we're going to pray for our loved ones that are not here today. That someday they will be here. And they'll have their own revelation. Right? Not a religious revelation. They'll have a revelation with God that their Father loves them and He is real. And Jesus died on the cross. He's their big brother. So, Father, we pray for everyone here and not here. For the loved ones, Father, no matter where they are in the world, no matter what kind of conditions they're in, whether they're in jail or whether they're in their gutter or whether they're in their pig pen, or whatever, Father, they're totally confused, thinking stupid things like suicide. Father, we pray for every one of them, that the very power and anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ come upon each one of them. We pray the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon them and call them home where they're supposed to be. Father, we ask for the fire of God, the lightning of heaven, the touch, the change, the renew, the restore, every one of them right now as they're speaking. And let them know as soon as they call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're righteous before the Father. Their sins are totally forgiven and they're brand new. And Dad, we thank you for this, and we give you the praise, and we give you the glory. And someday, they'll be here, giving their testimony, telling us about the goodness of God. And we ask this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen.